Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Care Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And I am pleased to welcome you to this Success Factor session on convening. Our speaker today is Dr. Sarah Abramson, Vice President, Strategy and Impact at the CJP in Boston. We only have 20 minutes together today. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass it over to Sarah. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Tamar, and thanks to JFN and JFNA, and hi to all my colleagues across the country. Um, I am a fast talker by nature, but I will tell you the last 20 minutes flew by. So um, for anybody who is interested in this topic, please reach out to me after I could talk about it all day, but I will try to give some space um, for any thoughts at the end. So I really wanted to focus today on this idea of convening for impact rather than convening for the sake of being together. And I wanted to start off by recommending a book called The Art of Convening um, by a couple called The Neils. Uh, and I can put the information in the chat at the end. And one of the things I like about the book, first of all, is that there is a book about convening, meaning that it's a topic that can be studied to be better understood. It's not innate to, in the, to, to any of us, really, to figure out how to gather. I think any of you who um, joined the GA can remember that Priya Parker, who um, gave an amazing presentation, reminds us that there is an art to gathering, but there's also an art to convening. And they really say in their book um, that you have to be invited in. You have to have the context set for you, but feel that you're participating in setting that context. You have to hear, feel that your voice is valued and that you haven't been brought to the table to check a box, which I think in this day and age is something that we all could be very dangerously teeting around. And then you have to feel that it's essential to your work and that you're creating something while you're there. And that, that idea of creation, very Jewish idea, really is what sparks what I call convening for collective impact or impact. And that is the approach that we've used here in Boston for fighting poverty, which has been highly successful. And really our success shifted dramatically when we shift, shifted from convening interesting people or convening around an interesting topic to using this artful science to convene for impact. And the way that we do that is around what I call collective impact. And I'll speak to what that means in a minute. But the first thing to mention, and you know, these are kind of ubiquitous, I would say you can use these in your personal life or in your professional life, but you must, must, must be practiced at using these for effective convening. These are principles of practice that here in Boston, when we began our anti-poverty work, we made commitments to each other, different organizations, that in order for this work to be successful, we have to acknowledge power dynamics. So for us in Boston, CJP is often the largest funder of our social service organizations, sometimes by a long stretch. For us to be oblivious to the fact that sometimes when we call people and we think we're asking them to do something they want to do, they're doing it because we're calling to ask them. You know, I, if you're on the receiving end of that from a federation, that may make you smile. If you are a federation, it may make you, hopefully it does make you cringe, but we still have to be aware that that is out there. We have to be able to talk about it. We can't just think about it. Um, I said to the last group, we have a rule here in Boston where if you're in a meeting and you are rolling your eyes, you have to stop the gathering and say, I am rolling my eyes. The worst thing to do when you're convening for impact, which is about lifting out what you hope to achieve out of your narrow ter territorialism, which is justified. You know, we all are here to do work on behalf of our organizations, but if we can't lift up and really think about the impact what we want to have and set our own needs second, then there's a lot of eye rolling and we need to be able to mention it. Um, and then you have to feel that you're participating in the setting of those goals and that there's a demonstration from all parts of the collective that you are willing to adapt the way you work. So here in Boston, for us, convening around collective impact meant taking on what is formally called collective impact work. If you're not familiar with it, I would suggest going to collectiveimpactforum.org. They do a great visual job of talking you through what this is. But there are five steps to effectively being um, a collective impact-based organization that convenes around impact. So why convene around impact? Convening just for convening is often one-on-one -on -one relationships with other organizations, even if you all happen to be in the same room. 
convening around impact is what is it we're trying to achieve? Who is the right person or the right organization to help us do that? And how will we hold each other accountable? And it means being brave enough to show other people when they're not living up to their side of the bargain and strong enough to claim when you feel that your work is propelling the collective. And those can be really difficult conversations. So step one for collective impact convening is to recognize, are you or do you work for a backbone organization? A backbone is the beating heart of a collective impact convening project. A backbone is necessary because it is able to step back and see 360 degrees. It by default cannot get mired in territorialism. It needs to see everything for what it is and the moving pieces. And there's some really practical steps when fighting poverty that it really needs to focus on. For us, that's been about storing data. You know, our organizations demonstrated six years ago how little faith they had in us here in Boston when they did not want to share data with us. They did not want to give client names to us. And so that meant us not bulldozing our way to getting those names or withholding funds, but instead saying, under what conditions could we share a database? And now all six organizations that participate in our, in our anti-poverty initiative share one database that's uh, held by a third party. So I can't see names, but I can see movement and I can see impact. The Blackbone organization needs to have really broad reach. Um, and I said to the last group too, that I'm very jealous of small communities because a lot of what we fix for in collective impact is the fact that in Boston, all of our organizations are in different towns, they have different leadership, and sometimes they have different philosophies and ways of working. So you actually are very fortunate in terms of collective impact work if you're in a smaller community and some of these gaps are, are less obvious. So step two, and this is very, very tricky, is to bring the right people to the right table in actually meaningful ways. And those meaningful ways need to be determined by the people once they get to the table. It's really counterintuitive to not decide what you're doing until you have the people at the table because how do you get the people there in the first place? So for us, it was about saying, we know that poverty is a growing issue in Boston and that is absolutely unacceptable to us. But we also know that we are not the experts in fighting poverty. And yet we do have several JFNCSs. We have an amazing JVS. We have Yad Chesed, which is a cash assistant organization. All of these organizations have existed for long periods of time in Boston, and their day-to-day -day work is to fight poverty. So we brought them together and together at the table, they decided what the impact we want to have. They decided how they're going to hold each other accountable, including CJP. And our job is to shepherd that process and ensure that everybody is acting on behalf of the collective. It requires everybody to be able to, in the kindest way possible, stop the conversation if anyone is acting uh, on an individual organizational behalf rather than on the impact we see. Step three is to say, how are we going to know that we're any good at this? And that's why the metrics conversation, as Susan said, to me, I'm a sociologist, so it's not boring at all, but it's also integral to the fidelity of what you're trying to achieve if you're convening for impact. Because when you bring people together in this artful way, you're not just there to have high level conversations. You're there to respond to the voices of those people who are being served and the data about them and the ways that you're working. So for us in Boston, our whole model is based on brain science that showed us here in Boston working with Harvard and MIT that one of the reasons, in fact, the largest reason that people who are in financial distress for more than three months stop making phone calls on their, on their own behalf is because it's so complicated and so much red tape. So our whole model when we brought people together was how do we lift the burden from the client and put it onto the community? And what that meant through these convenings is that we created a one-stop shop. No matter which organization you come into, there's one application, one set of services, and one caseworker who's going to shepherd you through, even when that caseworker needs to work outside of their particular organization. None of that could be done without high levels of trust 
It required fighting and times screaming. It required them coming back to CJP and saying, you did not get this right, or you're investing the money in other ways. But it wasn't just conversation. We were lucky enough to have data to show that what they were saying was backed up in the lived experience of our clients or in our success rates. And so having those two things, the trust and the data ensured that we were able to reevaluate and put the financial resources, human capital and otherwise towards the right issues that were gonna make a difference in the lives of our community members. So step four, I have found this to be the hardest part. You know, maybe it's just here in Boston, but we spend a lot of time in meetings at CJP. And we talk a lot about the art of a good meeting as well, but a meeting is really a form of convening. When you convene for collective impact, your emphasis again is on the impact. And so you need to have clarity and it has to evolve around when are we here to talk? When are we here to do work? How are we gonna make a decision by the time we, we walk out of this room? And then how are we gonna know that the decision that we made was a smart one? And that decision-making to me is the difference between a meeting and a collective impact project that's convening for action. We cannot just talk about fighting poverty. That does not feed people now, which is what people need from a chesed, from a caring standpoint. And it certainly does not change the systemic problem. It's important to talk about it, but talking does not immediately yield action. So in these convenings, you wanna chunk out your time and this needs to be built out collectively around how much do we wanna talk about the problem? How much do we wanna sit here and decide on solutions? And then when are we gonna come back and acknowledge to each other where we did things amazingly well and where we did things wrong? For us, we've always been able to use the data to motivate these. So for example, we have a high success rate here in Boston of moving people from crisis to stability. And a lot of that is to do with an amazing um, integration of vocational services into our work. But we kept seeing over and over again that people with mental health issues would get a job, but lose it, get a job, but lose it. And so, you know, there were all sorts of things that we could have done, more, more cash assistance to that person, um, outside referrals to that person. But instead we decided that we wanted to build out mental health support at our JVS, which is really unorthodox. Social work in our community has lived at JF and CSs and vocational support at JVS. Everybody, including the JF and CSs in our community had to be willing to give up the territory of that social workness and give it to the JBS because that's what our clients were asking for. And it has made an inordinate difference in our ability to support people to maintain a job. And then for, a, for like last but not least in any way is about this idea of authentic engagement. And it goes back to not kidding ourselves around the power dynamics, but also around how you take disagreement and celebrate your failures. So we have what we call failure celebrations here in Boston, which really incentivize honesty, that you are credited by the Federation or the backbone or by your colleagues in this collective impact model by saying, you know what, we tried something and it's not working. For us, the first thing that we had to celebrate a failure around was what we called a warm line. We wanted at CJP all of the calls across our community to go to one hotline number because we thought, it's enough having people call six different organizations. But what really we needed was one application, but any number of no wrong doors that people can enter through. We learned that from our clients and we learned that from convening at two levels. We convened at the executive director CEO level because we needed top organizational buy-in to transform our community. But, and this is really important, where the real work gets done is with the social workers they also convene. And sometimes like a helix, they come together, the executive directors and the social workers, but where a lot of the work gets done is in those social work meetings. Those are the frontline staff. They're the people who actually know what's going on in our community. And to kid ourselves, which we did in the beginning, that people who do amazing work, but are removed from the day-to-day -day experiences of many of our clients or community members was not optimal for getting the work done. So understanding that and understanding not just external power dynamics, but internal to each organization has been a game changer. And so just a little taste of what that has meant here in Boston. 
uh, we, were, we have been able to move from, I think, 4% of our community um, members receiving help from more than one organization to about half of people receiving help from more than one. Um, we had almost nobody moving to self-sufficiency in a quick amount of time when we began. Now 70% of our clients moved to self-sufficiency within nine months and even more in an extended period of time. Um, over 90% of our clients are in their job of choice within um, about six to nine months as well. Uh, and we have high client satisfaction, which to me, the preservation of dignity is uh, paramount to everything we do here in Boston. This is real poverty. Um, when I began this work, I was very lonely in this field. People used to tell me Jewish poverty was um, driving a 2012 Volvo, and then they would laugh. And really, I've taken that laughter and motivated us. And we're really proud in Boston uh, to have been in great conversations with people in Toronto, to have helped replicate our API in DC just this past fall um, in response to COVID, and to be continuing strong partnerships with folks in Philadelphia as they do this work too. So I really hope that if you do anything, you'll really elevate this idea of impact in your convening. Um, and I'm happy to take a question or two. Thank you so much. We have we have about five minutes, so we would love some questions and conversation for Sarah or for each other. I'll ask a question. Um, Sarah, thanks for your presentation. Just a one, uh, I really love the sort of evolution from sort of a one, you know, warm line to recognizing what the underlying challenge was. Can you talk to me about um, HIPAA and if the, the concerns about HIPAA was a barrier, um, your providers. Um, yes, yes. Karen, thanks for um, raising HIPAA. So um, I will never forget pulling over on the side of 128, which is a major highway, um, about six years ago, because the screaming on the conference call that I was on related to HIPAA was actually causing me to fear I was going to have a crash in my car. Um, I know exactly where I was. And actually, every time I pass it, I think of this moment. The issue around convening for impact versus convening in your own narrow framework forces us to say HIPAA is a giant issue. We cannot deny HIPAA is a giant issue, but we're not going to start with lawyers. We're going to start with what impact we seek to have. And when people feel that they have been brought into actually creating that impact, not having it be opposed, imposed upon them, they become inclined to say to their lawyers, I would like to be able to share my data. How can I make that happen? Versus oh, my lawyer says I can't share my data. And so for us, what that meant, and this is possible for us here in Boston, is that we hold a completely integrated database by a third party. I cannot access individual information, but I can access all trends sent to me by a third party consultant. So I know I can ask for an individual's journey, but more importantly, I can see whether our employment programs work whether if a person goes to an employment program and a self-help group that works, if the employment program married with cash assistance works better. So I think when people came to see, and then by the way, having the data and reporting back to people is also transformational because our social workers want to do what's right by our clients as do our CEOs. And when we have data to say, actually what we're doing is not working for people. It's much harder than the emotional ties over, but we've been doing it for this way forever and it's working fine. Um, but yes, HIPAA is real. And for us, it was um, able to be surmounted. I would say it took us 18 months though. Mary's asking, can the agencies access the data as well? Yes, so really important in a backbone and a collective impact model is that I don't see anything that other people can't see. I don't filter it, I don't adjust it. Um, they need to have access to the raw data. I do summarize it for people because that's a value add, but they have full access if they wanna go into the, um, into the raw data, they can. Um, it has to be transparency at every level, but a value add of being the Federation is that we have the tools to make sense of data for those who really can't afford the time. Thank you all so much. It's been great spending a few minutes. Sorry to be talking at you, but I'd love to hear from any of you who are continued in do, uh, doing such amazing work. We have so much to learn from all of you too. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for all of you.